When it comes to coloring line work in Affinity Designer, there are many options. In this video, we'll look at the Vector Flood Fill tool and explore its features. So let's jump in. What's up guys, it's Trent, and in a recent video, I talked about the Protect Alpha feature and how it could be used to color in your line work. I got some great comments on that video, including some about how the Vector Flood Fill tool could be used to do the same thing. So that tool will be the topic of this video. Now, as I was editing this video, it turned out to be much longer than I expected. So this video you're watching now will be part one. And in this part, I'll explain the Vector Flood Fill tool and its basic features. In part two, I'll show you a real world example of how to color an actual line work using Affinity Designer in the Vector Flood Fill tool. So if you want to be notified when that video appears, be sure to subscribe to this channel. It'll increase the chances that it's recommended to you in the future. Part two of this video should be out in a few days. Now, the Vector Flood Fill tool was released in Affinity Designer 2.1. And by default, it is not visible on the interface. So let me show you how to enable it. To get to the Vector Flood Fill tool, you want to go to View, Customize Tools. And then it's this icon here that looks like a paint bucket. So I'll just click and I'll drag it over to my tools over here. I'll put it somewhere in the middle. And then I'll close this window here. So this is what it looks like here when you have it in your tools. So it's not available by default. So be sure to add it if you want to use it often. Now, I kind of think of this tool as a cross between the Shape Builder tool and the Gradient Fill tool. It kind of does a little bit of both of them. So let's look at some basic functionality of this tool and see what we can do with it. So first of all, I'll do is I'll select this rectangle here. And you can see over here in my layers list, it's just a rectangle object. It's just a vector, nothing too special about it. And I'll just point out that it doesn't have a fill in there right now. So what I'll do now is I'll select the Vector Flood Fill tool. And then I'll select some color. I don't know, let's say blue. And now I can hover over here and you can see I get this paint bucket and I'll click and now it's filled in blue. And what's important to notice about this tool is if you look at the layer stack, you can see it actually created a separate curve underneath my rectangle here. So it didn't actually fill it in. It created a separate shape. Now, if I have my circle here, of course, another way to fill in the circle is to select the color. Let's say I want to make it red. Now with it selected, let me go back to the vector flood fill tool. Let me choose some other color green and I'll fill in my circle. So I'll hover over it and I'll click. So you can see in that case, it actually changed the fill color of my circle here. So it's a slight difference in behavior depending on whether your shape is open or closed. So something to keep in mind. This tool has a couple subtle aspects to it that might confuse you at first. So I'm gonna to try to cover them in this video. Now, so far, nothing really special has happened. Let me just undo these here. I'll delete this curve. So the real power of this tool happens when we have situations like this, where we have shapes overlapping each other. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select both my shapes here. And you can see I have them selected here in the layer stack. Now let me go to my vector flood tool and let's start adding colors now. And we can see is that I get the paint bucket here. And when I click, even though it's two separate shapes, it can actually let us fill in individual areas and I can change the color. Let's fill in the middle area with something different. Let's fill in the bottom right area with some type of blue. So if you ever use the shape builder tool, this might look kind of familiar to you. And again, looking at the layer stack here, what's important to realize is that we have separate curves created for each of these colors. So for example, I could pull out this green. That's basically what we created when we did the green part. And same thing with this reddish part and the blue. So as usual with tools in Affinity Designer, when I have them selected, we see lots of different options up here. And these are the options for the vector fill tool. Let's explore some of them now. So I created two new shapes here. Again, it's just an ellipse and a rectangle. Let's put them over each other because that'll give us the most interesting results. And with the vector fill tool selected, I'll choose a color green. So let's look at the insertion modes here. And the key to understanding these is it's really gonna determine where the new shape that we create is placed. So by default, it says inside. So what does that mean? Well, let me click on my square here. So you can see it added this green. And what inside did is it added this green curve inside the rectangle here. So it basically clipped it in here, if you're familiar with that term. If I select something blue, and let's say I add it to my circle here. If I expand my circle, you can see the curve got added in there. So if you look at the inside icon here, you can see it's basically showing what happens. Our new shapes get placed inside our existing shapes. So let's undo this. This will be more clear when we look at what the next one does. So let me select the in-between mode. So once again, I'll click on the square. And now you can see it did something much differently. Even though the result looks the same, the way it organized the layers and resulting shapes is different. So it basically broke apart our rectangle into the outline here, into a fill, and then it kept the original fill down below. So with in between selected, that's what it's going to do. It's going to break apart our shape and put the new curve in between the outline of our original shape and the fill color of it. Now, whether the difference between these two things matters to you is really going to depend on your work. 
Later on in the video, when I do the demo, I'll have it set to the inside mode, but the in-between mode is also there if that's what you want. Okay, now let's look at the fill modes here. And the first one is this plus sign that says add on top. You may be wondering, add on top of what? Well, to appreciate this feature, we have to look at something called the appearance tab. So if I select an object, I can go to this appearance tab over here. And if you don't see the appearance tab, go to window appearance and I'll make it show up. But what this is gonna show is these strokes and fills on your shape. Now, why is that important? Well, the cool thing is we can actually add multiple fills and strokes to our shapes. So for example, by default, I have a stroke here. I can add another stroke and let's change the color. Now it's not showing up because the size is very small. Let me make it bigger. And now you can see I have this second stroke. Now the order of them matters. It's a layer stack, so I can actually move this down. And with my shape selected here, you can see I have the two strokes. I can even add a third one if I want. I'll make it green. Let's again make it really big. So this is something we can do with all our vectors. Let me delete the strokes just so it's clearer. Now what we can also do is add another fill. So let me add a fill here. And I can change the color of it, I'll make it green. Now it seems kind of pointless at first because it's completely blocking the other fill, but the interesting thing is I can add gradients to it and change the blend mode. So with it selected, I can easily just click the gradient tool here, drag it out. Let's say I want to change the gradient. I'll make it some type of black and white here. And on the appearance tab, what I can do is I can set this to multiply or some other blend mode. Now you can see the effect that this fill is having on the one below it. So it is possible to add multiple fills and strokes to a shape. So I'll delete this fill here. So let's go back to our vector fill tool here. I have my ellipse selected. Let's select the color like green. And then I'll click on it. And you have to click off and on appearance for it to refresh. And it didn't actually add another fill. It just replaced the current one. So what does this add on top mean? Well, the secret here is that it only does it when we have a semi-transparent color. So let's go back to our color. I'll choose some type of like bright red here. And you have to have the opacity less than 100% for this to work. So let me go down to say 25%. And with my shape selected, I have my vector fill tool selected. So I'll click on this three times, one, two, three. And you can see it got darker each time. If I go to the appearance tab, you can see I added three fills here. I can click on it again. And we have to click off it and go back to it for it to refresh. So now I have four fills here. So again, kind of a subtle thing. I don't really use it that much, but it's good to know. Now the smart refill option is exactly the same as what I just said, except it doesn't stack multiple transparencies. So when I added those transparencies, it only would have added one of them. And this can be useful when you have a complicated shape with lots of overlaps, but I'll just pass over it for now. So the last option we have here is knockout. I'll select that. And what knockout is gonna do is it's just gonna determine how our shapes are broken up again. It's yet another option of how we want the shapes to be divided. So if I click on my square here, Notice how it took the original rectangle and it knocked out our green and our original blue. If I undo this, the old way that it worked, if I click this, it would just put the green here and keep our original rectangle as blue up here. So again, a subtle difference, not super important, but worth pointing out. And finally, with both of these selected, we have this fill to visible boundaries option. And this is really just gonna determine, does it take into account all the lines of our shapes or just the lines that we see? So with it selected, I'll click on my circle and it's filled in the whole circle, and that's because these are the only boundaries that I see right now. Let me undo this and I'll show you the other way. So without it selected, if I click on my circle over here, it just fills in this part. Even though I can't see the boundaries of the square here, it's still considering that when it fills in the area. Now in addition to filling in with colors, there's a bitmap fill option. It has lots of nuances, so I won't go into it in detail in this video, but let me know if you want me to do a follow-up video that specifically talks about using the bitmap fills. Now, before moving on, I just want to point out one other subtle aspect of this tool. We can actually use it to fill in shapes that aren't selected yet. So if I have nothing selected here, I can select my vector flood tool. And if I click on shapes, I can change their color. I can change the color over here and then click on something. Now, what's interesting to note is that when I do this, the cursor doesn't change. So it's just a pointer, but if I click on this, it's still changing the color. So that can be a useful way to recolor lots of objects without having to select all of them manually. Now this doesn't really work if your shapes are empty. So right here, let me click on my flood tool again. If I click on the empty space in between them, nothing happens. You actually have to click on the boundaries here of the shape. So I'll click on the edge of the square here and it fills in. So with the star, I'll click in the middle. Nothing's happening because it's empty. But if I click on the edge, I can fill it in. So again, a subtle difference between filled shapes and empty shapes. In part two, I'll show you how to use the vector flood fill tool to color in real world line work. 
And I'll also show you how you can combine it with the Pixel Persona to do raster painting. That video should be out in a few days, so keep an eye out for it. In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.